The Man in the Iron Mask by Alexandre Dumas Chapter Eight: The General of the Order There was now a brief silence, during which Aramis never removed his eyes from Baisemeaux for a moment. The latter seemed only half decided to disturb himself thus in the middle of supper, and it was clear he was trying to invent some pretext, whether good or bad, for delay, at any rate till after dessert and it appeared also that he had hit upon an excuse at last. "'Eh? But it is impossible!' he cried. "'How impossible?' said Aramis. "'Give me a glimpse of this impossibility.' "'Tis impossible to set a prisoner at liberty at such an hour. Where can he go to, a man so unacquainted with Paris?' "'He will find a place wherever he can.' You see now, one might as well set a blind man free. I have a carriage, and will take him wherever he wishes. You have an answer for everything. Francois, tell Monsieur le Major to go and open the cell of Monsieur Selden, number three, Batardiere. Selden? exclaimed Aramis, very naturally. You said Selden, I think. I said Selden, of course. "'Tis the name of the man they set free.' "'Oh, you mean to say Marchiali?' said Aramis. "'Marchiali? Oh, yes, indeed. No, no, no Selden.' "'I think you are making a mistake, Monsieur Besmo. "'I have read the order.' "'And I also.' "'And I saw Selden in letters as large as that.' And Besmo held up his finger. "'And I read Marchiali in characters as large as this,' said Aramis, also holding up two fingers. "'To the proof let us throw a light on the matter,' said Baisemeaux, confident he was right. "'There is the paper. You have only to read it.' "'I read Marchiali,' returned Aramis, spreading out the paper. "'Look!' Baisemeaux looked, and his arms dropped suddenly. "'Yes, yes!' he said, quite overwhelmed. Yes, Marchiali. Tis plainly written, Marchiali. Quite true. Ah! How? The man of whom we have talked so much. The man whom they are every day telling me to take such care of. There is Marchiali, repeated the inflexible Aramis. I must own it, Monseigneur, but I understand nothing about it. You believe your eyes, at any rate. To tell me very plainly, there is Marchiali. And in good handwriting, too. Tis a wonder. I still see this order and the name of Selden, Irishman. I see it. Ah, I even recollect that under this name there was a blot of ink. No, there is no ink. No, there is no blot. Oh, but there was, though. I know it, because I rubbed my finger, this very one, in the powder that was over the blot. In a word, be it how it may, dear Monsieur Baisemeaux, said Aramis, and whatever you may have seen, the order is signed to release Marchiali, blot or no blot. The order is signed to release Marchiali, replied Baisemeaux mechanically, endeavouring to regain his courage. And you are going to release this prisoner. If your heart dictates you to deliver Selden also, I declare to you I will not oppose it at the least in the world. Aramis accompanied this remark with a smile, the irony of which effectually dispelled Baisemeaux's confusion of mind and restored his courage. Monseigneur, he said, this Marchiali is the very same prisoner whom the other day a priest confessor of our order came to visit in so imperious and so secret a manner. "'I don't know that, monsieur,' replied the bishop. "'Tis no such long time ago, dear monsieur d'Herblay.' "'It is true, but with us, monsieur, it is good that the man of to-day should no longer know what the man of yesterday did.' "'In any case,' said Baisemeaux, "'the visit of the Jesuit confessor must have given happiness to this man.' Aramis made no reply, but recommenced eating and drinking. As for Baisemeaux, no longer touching anything that was on the table, 
he again took up the order and examined it every way. This investigation, under ordinary circumstances, would have made the ears of the impatient Aramis burn with anger, but the Bishop of Vannes did not become incensed for so little, above all, when he had murmured to himself that to do so was dangerous. "'Are you going to release Marchiali? he said. "'What mellow, fragrant, and delicious sherry this is, my dear governor!' "'Monseigneur,' replied Baisemeaux, "'I shall release the prisoner Marchiali when I have summoned the courier who brought the order, and above all when, by interrogating him, I have satisfied myself.' "'The order is sealed, and the courier is ignorant of the contents. What do you want to satisfy yourself about?' "'Be it so, Monseigneur, but I shall send to the ministry, and Monsieur de Lyon will either confirm or withdraw the order.' "'What is the good of all that?' asked Aramis coldly. "'What good?' "'Yes. What is your object, I ask?' "'The object of never deceiving oneself, Monseigneur, nor being wanting in the respect which a subaltern owes to his superior officers, nor infringing the duties of a service one has accepted of one's own free will.' "'Very good. You have just spoken so eloquently.' that I cannot but admire you. It is true that a subaltern owes respect to his superiors. He is guilty when he deceives himself, and he should be punished if he infringed either the duties or laws of his office. Baisemeaux looked at the bishop with astonishment. It follows, pursued Aramis, that you are going to ask advice, to put your conscience at ease in the matter. Yes, Monseigneur. And if a superior officer gives you orders, you will obey? Never doubt it, Monseigneur. You know the king's signature well, Monsieur de Baisemeaux? Yes, Monseigneur. Is it not on this order of release? It is true, but it may. Be forged, you mean? That is evident, Monseigneur. You are right. And that of Monsieur de Lyon? I see it plain enough on the order, but for the same reason that the king's signature may have been forged, so also, and with even greater probability, may Monsieur de Lyon's. Your logic has the stride of a giant, Monsieur de Baisemeaux, said Aramis, and your reasoning is irresistible. But on what special grounds do you base your idea that these signatures are false? On this the absence of counter-signatures. Nothing checks His Majesty's signature, and M. de Lyon is not there to tell me he has signed. "'Well, M. de Baisemeaux,' said Aramis, bending an eagle glance on the governor, "'I adopt so frankly your doubts, and your mode of clearing them up, that I will take a pen if you will give me one.' Baisemeaux gave him a pen. "'And a sheet of white paper,' added Aramis." Baisemeaux handed him some paper. Now I, I also, I here present, incontestably, I am going to write an order to which I am certain you will give credence, incredulous as you are. Baisemeaux turned pale at this icy assurance of manner. It seemed to him that the voice of the bishops, but just now so playful and gay, had become funereal and sad that the wax lights changed into the tapers of a mortuary chapel, the very glasses of wine into chalices of blood. Aramis took a pen and wrote. Baisemeaux, in terror, read over his shoulder. A. M. D. G., wrote the bishop, and he drew a cross under these four letters, which signify Ad Majorum Dei Glorium, to the greater glory of God. And thus he continued. It is our pleasure that the order brought to Monsieur de Baisemeaux de Montluzon, governor for the king of the castle of the Bastille, be held by him good and effectual, and be immediately carried into operation. Signed, D'Herblay, General of the Order, by the grace of God. Baisemeaux was so profoundly astonished that his features remained contracted, his lips parted, and his eyes fixed. He did not move an inch, nor articulate a sound. 
nothing could be heard in that large chamber but the wing whisper of a little moth which was fluttering to its death about the candles aramis without even deigning to look at the man whom he had reduced to so miserable a condition drew from his pocket a small case of black wax he sealed the letter and stamped it with a seal suspended at his breast beneath his doublet and when the operation was concluded presented still in silence the missive to monsieur de baisemeaux the latter whose hands trembled in a manner to excite pity turned a dull and meaningless gaze upon the letter a last gleam of feeling played over his features and he fell as if thunderstruck on a chair come come said aramis after a long silence during which the governor of the bastille had slowly recovered his senses do not lead me to believe, dear Bismaud, that the presence of the general of the order is as terrible as his, and that men die merrily from having seen him. Take courage, rouse yourself, give me your hand, obey. Bismaud, reassured if not satisfied, obeyed, kissed Aramis's hand, and rose. Immediately, he murmured, oh there is pressing haste my host take your place again and do the honors over this beautiful dessert monseigneur i shall never recover such a shock as this i who have laughed who have jested with you i who have dared to treat you on a footing of equality say nothing about it old comrade replied the bishop who perceived how strained the cord was and how dangerous it would have been to break it say nothing about it let us each live in our own way to you my protection and my friendship to me your obedience having exactly fulfilled these two requirements let us live happily baisemeaux reflected he perceived at a glance the consequence of this withdrawal of a prisoner by means of a forged order and putting in the scale the guarantee offered him by the official order of the general did not consider it of any value. Aramis divined this. "'My dear Baisemeaux,' said he, "'you are a simpleton. Lose this habit of reflection when I give myself the trouble to think for you.' And at another gesture he made, Baisemeaux bowed again. "'How shall I set about it?' he said. "'What is the process for releasing a prisoner?' "'I have the regulations.' well then follow the regulations my friend i go with my major to the prisoner's room and conduct him if he is a personage of importance but this marchiali is not an important personage said aramis carelessly i don't know answered the governor as if he would have said it is for you to instruct me then if you don't know it i am right so act towards marchiali as you act towards one of obscure station good the regulations so provide they are to the effect that the turnkey or one of the lower officials shall bring the prisoner before the governor in the office well tis very wise that and then then we return to the prisoner the valuables he wore at the time of his imprisonment his clothes and papers, if the minister's orders have not otherwise dictated. What was the minister's order as to this Marchiali? Nothing, for the unhappy man arrived here without jewels, without papers, and almost without clothes. See how simple, then, it all is. Indeed, Baisemeaux, you make a mountain of everything. Remain here, and make them bring the prisoner to the governor's house." Baisemeaux obeyed. He summoned his lieutenant, and gave him an order, which the latter passed on, without disturbing himself about it, to the next whom it concerned. Half an hour afterwards they heard a gate shut in the court. It was the door to the dungeon, which had just rendered up its prey to the free air. Aramis blew out all the candles which lighted the room, but one, which he left burning behind the door. This flickering glare prevented the sight from resting steadily on any object. It multiplied tenfold the changing forms and shadows of the place by its wavering uncertainty. Steps drew near. 
"'Go and meet your men,' said Aramis to Baisemeaux. The governor obeyed. The sergeant and turnkeys disappeared. Baisemeaux re-entered, followed by a prisoner. Aramis had placed himself in the shade. He saw without being seen. Baisemeaux, in an agitated tone of voice, made the young man acquainted with the order which set him at liberty. The prisoner listened, without making a single gesture or saying a word. "'You will swear. Tis the regulation that requires it,' added the governor. "'Never to reveal anything that you have seen or heard in the Bastille.' The prisoner perceived a crucifix. He stretched out his hands and swore with his lips. "'And now, monsieur, you are free. Whither do you intend going?' The prisoner turned his head, as if looking behind him for some protection on which he ought to rely. Then was it that Aramis came out of the shade. "'I am here,' he said, "'to render the gentleman whatever service he may please to ask.' The prisoner slightly reddened, and, without hesitation, passed his arm through that of Aramis. "'God have you in his holy keeping,' he said, in a voice the firmness of which made the governor tremble as much as the form of the blessing astonished him. Aramis, on shaking hands with Baisemeaux, said to him, "'Does my order trouble you? Do you fear their finding it here, should they come to search?' "'I desire to keep it, Monseigneur,' said Baisemeaux. "'If they found it here, it would be a certain indication I should be lost, and in that case you would be a powerful and a last auxiliary for me.' "'Being your accomplice, you mean,' answered Aramis, shrugging his shoulders. "'Adieu, Baisemeaux,' said he. The horses were in waiting making each rusty spring reverberate the carriage again with their impatience. Baisemeaux accompanied the bishop to the bottom of the steps. Aramis caused his companion to mount before him, then followed, and without giving the driver any further order, "'Go on,' said he. The carriage rattled over the pavement of the courtyard. An officer with a torch went before the horses, and gave orders at every post to let them pass. During the time taken in opening all the barriers, Aramis barely breathed, and you might have heard his sealed heart knock against his ribs. The prisoner, buried in a corner of the carriage, made no more sign of life than his companion. At length, a jolt more severe than the others announced to them that they had cleared the last watercourse. Behind the carriage closed the last gate, that in the Rue Saint-Antoine. No more walls, either on the right or the left. Heaven everywhere, liberty everywhere, and life everywhere. The horses, kept in check by a vigorous hand, went quietly as far as the middle of the Faubourg. There they began to trot. Little by little, whether they were warming to their work, or whether they were urged, they gained in swiftness, and once past Bercy, the carriage seemed to fly so great was the ardour of the coursers. The horses galloped thus as far as Villeneuve-Saint-Georges, where relays were waiting. Then four, instead of two, whirled the carriage away in the direction of Melun, and pulled up for a moment in the middle of the forest of Senar. No doubt the order had been given the postillion beforehand, for Aramis had no occasion even to make a sign. "'What is the matter?' asked the prisoner, as if waking from a long dream. The matter is, Monseigneur, said Aramis, that before going further, it is necessary your Royal Highness and I should converse. I will await an opportunity, Monsieur, answered the young prince. We could not have a better, Monseigneur. We are in the middle of a forest, and no one can hear us. The postillion? The postillion of this relay is deaf and dumb, Monseigneur. I am at your service, Monsieur de Blais. Is it your pleasure to remain in the carriage? Yes, we are comfortably seated, and I like this carriage, for it has restored me to liberty. Wait, Monseigneur, there is yet a precaution to be taken. What? We are here on the highway. Cavaliers or carriages travelling like ourselves might pass, and seeing us stopping deem us in some difficulty. 
Let us avoid offers of assistance which would embarrass us. Give the postilion orders to conceal the carriage in one of the side avenues. Tis exactly what I wish to do, Monseigneur. Aramis made a sign to the deaf and dumb driver of the carriage, whom he touched on the arm. The latter, dismounted, took the leaders by the bridle, and led them over the velvet sward in the mossy grass of a winding alley, at the bottom of which, on this moonless night, the deep shades formed a curtain blacker than ink. This done, the man lay down on a slope near his horses, who on either side kept nibbling the young oak shoots. "'I am listening,' said the young prince to Aramis. "'But what are you doing there?' "'I am disarming myself of my pistols, of which we have no further need, Monseigneur.' Chapter 9 The Tempter "'My prince,' said Aramis, turning in the carriage towards his companion, "'weak creature as I am, so unpretending in genius, so low in the scale of intelligent beings, it has never yet happened to me to converse with a man without penetrating his thoughts through that living mask which has been thrown over our mind, in order to retain its expression. But to-night, in this darkness, in the reserve which you maintain, I can read nothing on your features, and something tells me that I shall have great difficulty in wresting from you a sincere declaration. I beseech you, then, not for love of me, for subjects should never weigh as anything in the balance which princes hold, but for love of yourself, to retain every syllable, every inflection which, under the present most grave circumstances, will all have a sense and value as important as any ever uttered in the world. I listen, replied the young prince, decidedly, without either eagerly seeking or fearing anything that you are about to say to me and he buried himself still deeper in the thick cushions of the carriage, trying to deprive his companion not only of the sight of him, but even of the very idea of his presence. Black was the darkness which fell wide and dense from the summits of the intertwining trees. The carriage, covered in by this prodigious roof, would not have received a particle of light, not even if a ray could have struggled through the wreaths of mist that were already rising in the avenue. Monseigneur, resumed Aramis, you know the history of the government which today controls France. The king issued from an infancy imprisoned like yours, obscure as yours, and confined as yours, only, instead of ending, like yourself, this slavery in a prison, this obscurity in solitude, these straitened circumstances in concealment, he was fain to bear all these miseries, humiliations and distresses in full daylight under the pitiless sun of royalty on an elevation flooded with light where every stain appears a blemish every glory a stain the king has suffered it rankles in his mind and he will avenge himself he will be a bad king i say not that he will pour out his people's blood like louis the eleventh or charles the ninth for he has no mortal injuries to avenge, but he will devour the means and substance of his people, for he has himself undergone wrongs in his own interest and money. In the first place, then, I acquit my conscience when I consider openly the merits and the faults of this great prince, and if I condemn him, my conscience absolves me. Aramis paused. It was not to listen if the silence of the forest remained undisturbed, but it was to gather up his thoughts from the very bottom of his soul, to leave the thoughts he had uttered sufficient time to eat deeply into the mind of his companion. "'All that heaven does, heaven does well,' continued the Bishop of Vaughan, "'and I am so persuaded of it that I have long been thankful to have been chosen depository of the secret which I have aided you to discover.' to a just providence was necessary an instrument, at once penetrating, persevering, and convinced, to accomplish a great work. I am this instrument. I possess penetration, perseverance, conviction. I govern a mysterious people, who has taken for its motto the motto of God, Patiens quia 
Oeternus. The prince moved. I divine, Monseigneur, why you are raising your head, and are surprised at the people I have under my command. You did not know you were dealing with a king. <laughs> oh, Monseigneur, king of a people very humble, much disinherited. Humble because they have no force save when creeping. Disinherited, because never, almost never in this world, do my people reap the harvest they sow, nor eat the fruit they cultivate. They labor for an abstract idea. They heap together all the atoms of their power, to from a single man. And round this man, with the sweat of their labor, they create a misty halo, which his genius shall, in turn, render a glory gilded with the rays of all the crowns in Christendom. Such is the man you have beside you, Monseigneur. It is to tell you that he has drawn you from the abyss for a great purpose, to raise you above the powers of the earth, above himself. The prince lightly touched Aramis's arm. You speak to me, he said, of that religious order whose chief you are. For me, the result of your words is, that the day you desire to hurl down the man you shall have raised, the event will be accomplished, and that you will keep under your hand your creation of yesterday. Undeceive yourself, Monseigneur, replied the bishop. I should not take the trouble to play this terrible game with your royal highness, if I had not a double interest in gaining it. The day you are elevated, you are elevated forever. You will overturn the footstool, as you rise, and will send it rolling so far, that not even the sight of it will ever again recall to you its right to simple gratitude. Oh, monsieur! Your movement, monseigneur, arises from an excellent disposition. I thank you. Be well assured, I aspire to more than gratitude. I am convinced that, when arrived at the summit, you will judge me still more worthy to be your friend. And then, Monseigneur, we too will do such great deeds that ages hereafter shall long speak of them. Tell me plainly, Monsieur, tell me without disguise, what I am to-day, and what you aim at my being to-morrow. You are the son of King Louis the Thirteenth, brother of Louis the Fourteenth, natural and legitimate heir to the throne of France. In keeping you near him, as monsieur has been kept, monsieur, your younger brother, the king reserved to himself the right of being legitimate sovereign. The doctors only could dispute his legitimacy, but the doctors always prefer the king who is to the king who is not. Providence has willed that you should be persecuted. This persecution today consecrates you king of France. You had then a right to reign, seeing that it is disputed. You had a right to be proclaimed, seeing that you have been concealed. And you possess royal blood, since no one has dared to shed yours, as that of your servants has been shed. Now see, then, what this providence, which you have so often accused of having in every way thwarted you, has done for you. It has given you the features, figure, age, and voice of your brother, and the very causes of your persecution are about to become those of your triumphant restoration. Tomorrow, after tomorrow, from the very first, regal phantom, living shade of Louis the Fourteenth, you will sit upon his throne, whence the will of heaven, confided in execution to the arm of man, will have hurled him without hope of return. I understand, said the prince, my brother's blood will not be shed, then. You will be the sole arbiter of his fate. The secret of which they made an evil use against me? You will employ it against him. What did he do to conceal it? He concealed you. Living image of himself, you will defeat the conspiracy of Mazarin and Anne of Austria. You, my prince, will have the same interest in concealing him, who will, as a prisoner, resemble you, and as you will resemble him as a king. I fall back on what I was saying to you. Who will guard him? Who guarded you? You know this secret. 
You have made use of it with regard to myself. Who else knows it? The Queen Mother and Madame de Chevreuse. What will they do? Nothing, if you choose. How is that? How can they recognize you, if you act in such a manner that no one can recognize you? Tis true. But there are grave difficulties. State them, Prince. My brother is married. I cannot take my brother's wife. I will cause Spain to consent to a divorce. It is in the interest of your new policy. It is human morality. All that is really noble and really useful in this world will find its account therein. The imprisoned king will speak. To whom do you think he will speak? To the walls? You mean, by walls, the men in whom you put confidence? If need be, yes. And besides, your royal highness? Besides? I was going to say that the designs of Providence do not stop on such a fair road. Every scheme of this calibre is completed by its results, like a geometrical calculation. The king, in prison, will not be for you the cause of embarrassment that you have been for the king enthroned. His soul is naturally proud and impatient. It is, moreover, disarmed and enfeebled by being accustomed to honours and by the license of supreme power. The same providence which has willed that the concluding step in the geometrical calculation I have had the honour of describing to your royal highness, should be your ascension to the throne, and the destruction of him who is hurtful to you, has also determined that the conquered one shall soon end both his own and your sufferings. Therefore, his soul and body have been adapted for but a brief agony, Put into prison as a private individual, left alone with your doubts, deprived of everything, you have exhibited the most sublime, enduring principle of life in withstanding all this. But your brother, a captive, forgotten, and in bonds, will not long endure the calamity, and heaven will resume his soul at the appointed time, that is to say, soon. At this point in Aramis's gloomy analysis, a bird of night uttered from the depths of the forest that prolonged and plaintive cry which makes every creature tremble. "'I will exile the deposed king,' said Philippe, shuddering. "'Twill be more human.' "'The king's good pleasure will decide the point,' said Aramis. "'But has the problem been well put?' Have I brought out of the solution according to the wishes or the foresight of your royal highness? Yes, monsieur, yes. You have forgotten nothing, except, indeed, two things. The first? Let us speak of it at once, with the same frankness we have already conversed in. Let us speak of the causes which may bring about the ruin of all the hopes we have conceived. Let us speak of the risks we are running. They would be immense, infinite, terrific, insurmountable, if, as I have said, all things did not concur to render them of absolutely no account. There is no danger either for you or for me, if the constancy and intrepidity of your royal highness are equal to that perfection of resemblance to your brother which nature has bestowed upon you. I repeat it. There are no dangers, only obstacles. A word, indeed, which I find in all languages, but have always ill understood, and, were I king, would have obliterated as useless and absurd. Yes, indeed, monsieur, there is a very serious obstacle, an insurmountable danger, which you are forgetting. Ah, said Aramis, there is conscience, which cries aloud, remorse that never dies. "'True, true,' said the bishop. "'There is a weakness of heart of which you remind me. "'You are right, too, for that, indeed, is an immense obstacle. "'The horse, afraid of the ditch, leaps into the middle of it and is killed. "'The man who, trembling, crosses his sword with that of another, "'leaves loopholes whereby his enemy has him in his power.' "'Have you a brother?' said the young man to Aramis. 
I am alone in the world, said the latter with a hard, dry voice. But surely there is someone in the world whom you love, added Philippe. No one. Yes, I love you. The young man sank into so profound a silence that the mere sound of his respiration seemed like a roaring tumult for Aramis. Monseigneur, he resumed, I have not said all I had to say to your royal highness. I have not offered you all of the salutary counsels and useful resources which I have at my disposal. It is useless to flash bright visions before the eyes of one who seeks and loves darkness. Useless, too, is it to let the magnificence of the cannon's roar make itself heard in the ears of one who loves repose and the quiet of the country. Monseigneur, I have your happiness spread out before me in my thoughts. Listen to my words, precious they indeed are, in their import and their sense, for you who look with such tender regard upon the bright heavens, the verdant meadows, the pure air. I know a country instinct with delights of every kind, an unknown paradise, a secluded corner of the world, where alone, unfettered and unknown, in the thick covert of the woods, amidst flowers and streams of rippling water, you will forget all the misery that human folly has so recently allotted you. Oh, listen to me, my prince. I do not jest. I have a heart, and mind, and soul, and can read your own, I, even to its depths. I will not take you unready for your task, in order to cast you into the crucible of my own desires, of my caprice, or my ambition. Let it be all or nothing. You are chilled and galled, sick at heart, overcome by excess of the emotions which but one hour's liberty has produced in you. For me, that is a certain and unmistakable sign that you do not wish to continue at liberty. Would you prefer a more humble life, a life more suited to your strength? Heaven is my witness, that I wish your happiness to be the result of the trial to which I have exposed you. Speak, speak, said the prince, with a vivacity which did not escape Aramis. I know, resumed the prelate, in the bas Poitou, a canton, of which no one in France suspects the existence. Twenty leagues of country is immense, is it not? Twenty leagues, Monseigneur, all covered with water and herbage, and reeds of the most luxuriant nature, the whole studded with islands covered with woods of the densest foliage. These large marshes, covered with reeds as with a thick mantle, sleep silently and calmly beneath the sun's soft and genial rays. A few fishermen with their families indolently pass their lives away there, with their great living rafts of poplar and alder, the flooring formed of reeds, and the roof woven out of thick rushes. These barks, these floating houses, are wafted to and fro by the changing winds. Whenever they touch a bank, it is but by chance, and so gently, too, that the sleeping fisherman is not awakened by the shock. Should he wish to land, it is merely because he has seen a large flight of landrails or plovers, of wild ducks, teal, widgeon, or woodchucks, which fall an easy prey to net or gun. Silver shad, eels, greedy pike, red and grey mullet, swim in shoals into his nets. He has but to choose the finest and largest, and return the others to the waters. Never yet has the food of the stranger, be he soldier or simple citizen, never has any one, indeed, penetrated into that district. The sun's rays there are soft and tempered. In plots of solid earth, whose soil is swart and fertile, grows the vine, nourishing with generous juice its purple, white, and golden grapes. Once a week, a boat is sent to deliver the bread which has been baked at an oven, the common property of all. There, like the seigneurs of early days, powerful in virtue of your dogs, your fishing lines, your guns, and your beautiful reed-built house, would you live, rich in the produce of the chase, in plentitude of absolute secrecy. There would years of your life roll away, 
at the end of which, no longer recognizable, for you would have been perfectly transformed, you would have succeeded in acquiring a destiny accorded to you by heaven. There are a thousand pistoles in this bag, Monseigneur, more, far more, than sufficient to purchase the whole marsh of which I have spoken, more than enough to live there as many years as you have days to live, more than enough to constitute you the richest, the freest, and the happiest man in the country. Accept it, as I offer it you, sincerely, cheerfully. Forthwith, without a moment's pause, I will unharness two of my horses, which are attached to the carriage yonder, and they, accompanied by my servant, my deaf and dumb attendant, shall conduct you, travelling throughout the night, sleeping during the day, to the locality I have described, and I shall at least have the satisfaction of knowing that I have rendered to my prince the major service he himself preferred. I shall have made one human being happy, and heaven for that will hold me in better account than if I had made one man powerful. The former task is far more difficult. And now, Monseigneur, your answer to this proposition. Here is the money. Nay, do not hesitate. At Poitou you can risk nothing, except the chance of catching the fevers prevalent there, and even of them the so-called wizards of the country will cure you for the sake of your pistoles. If you play the other game, you run the chance of being assassinated on a throne, strangled in a prison cell. Upon my soul, I assure you, now I begin to compare them together, I myself should hesitate which lot I should accept. Monsieur, replied the young prince, before I determine, let me alight from this carriage, walk on the ground, and consult that still voice within me, which heaven bids us all to hearken to. Ten minutes is all I ask, and then you shall have your answer. As you please, Monseigneur, said Aramis, bending before him with respect, so solemn and august in tone and address had sounded these strange words. CHAPTER Ten: CROWN AND TIARA Aramis was the first to descend from the carriage. He held the door open for the young man. He saw him place his foot on the mossy ground with a trembling of the whole body, and walk round the carriage with an unsteady and almost tottering step. It seemed as if the poor prisoner was unaccustomed to walk on God's earth. It was the 15th of August, about eleven o'clock at night. Thick clouds, portending a tempest, overspread the heavens, and shrouded every light and prospect underneath their heavy folds. The extremities of the avenues were imperceptibly detached from the copse, by a lighter shadow of opaque grey, which upon closer examination became visible in the midst of the obscurity. But the fragrance which ascended from the grass, fresher and more penetrating than that which exhaled from the trees around him, the warm and balming air which enveloped him for the first time for many years past, the ineffable enjoyment of liberty and an open country, spoke to the prince in so seductive a language, that notwithstanding the preternatural caution, we would almost say dissimulation of his character, of which we have tried to give an idea, he could not restrain his emotion and breathe a sigh of ecstasy. Then, by degrees, he raised his aching head and inhaled the softly scented air, as it was wafted in gentle gusts to his uplifted face. Crossing his arms on his chest, as if to control the new sensation of delight, he drank in delicious draughts of that mysterious air which interpenetrates at night the loftiest forests. The sky he was contemplating, the murmuring waters, the universal freshness, was not all this reality? Was not Aramis a madman to suppose that he had aught else to dream of in this world? Those exciting pictures of country life, so free from fears and troubles, the ocean of happy days that glitters incessantly before all young imaginations, are real allurements wherewith to fascinate a poor, unhappy prisoner, worn out by prison cares, emaciated by the stifling air of the Bastille. It was the picture, it will be remembered, drawn by Aramis when he offered the thousand pistoles he had with him in the carriage to the prince, 
and the enchanted Eden which the deserts of Bas Poitou hid from the eyes of the world. Such were the reflections of Aramis as he watched, with an anxiety impossible to describe, the silent progress of the emotions of Philippe, whom he perceived gradually becoming more and more absorbed in his meditations. The young prince was offering up an inward prayer to heaven, to be divinely guided in this trying moment, upon which his life, or death, depended. It was an anxious time for the bishop of Vannes, who had never before been so perplexed. His iron will, accustomed to overcome all obstacles, never finding itself inferior or vanquished on any occasion, to be foiled in so vast a project from not having foreseen the influence which a view of nature in all its luxuriance could have on a human mind. Aramis, overwhelmed by anxiety, contemplated with emotion the painful struggle that was taking place in Philippe's mind. This suspense lasted the whole ten minutes which the young man had requested. During the space of time, which appeared an eternity, Philippe continued gazing with an imploring and sorrowful look towards the heavens. Aramis did not remove the piercing glance he had fixed on Philippe. Suddenly the young man bowed his head. His thought returned to the earth, his looks perceptibly hardened, his brow contracted, his mouth assuming an expression of undaunted courage. Again his looks became fixed, but this time they wore a worldly expression, hardened by covetousness, pride, and strong desire. Aramis's look immediately became as soft as it had before been gloomy. Philippe, seizing his hand in a quick agitated manner, exclaimed, "'Lead me to where the crown of France is to be found.' "'Is this your decision, Monseigneur?' asked Aramis. "'It is.' "'Irrevocably so?' Philippe did not even deign to reply. He gazed earnestly at the bishop, as if to ask him if it were possible for a man to waver after having once made up his mind. "'Such looks are flashes of the hidden fire that betrays men's character.' said Aramis, bowing over Philippe's hand. "'You will be great, Monseigneur. I will answer for that.' "'Let us resume our conversation. I wish to discuss two points with you. In the first place, the dangers, or the obstacles we may meet with. That point is decided. The other is the conditions you intend imposing on me. It is your turn to speak, Monsieur de Blais.' "'The conditions, Monseigneur?' "'Doubtless.' You will not allow so mere a trifle to stop me, and you will not do me the injustice to suppose that I think you have no interest in this affair. Therefore, without subterfuge or hesitation, tell me the truth. I will do so, Monseigneur. Once a king... When will that be? Tomorrow evening. I mean, in the night. Explain yourself. When I shall have asked your highness a question do so. I sent to your highness a man in my confidence with instructions to deliver some closely written notes, carefully drawn up, which will thoroughly acquaint your highness with the different persons who compose and will compose your court. I peruse those notes. Attentively. I know them by heart. And understand them. Pardon me, but I may venture to ask that question of a poor, abandoned captive of the Bastille. In a week's time it will not be requisite to further question a mind like yours. You will then be in full possession of liberty and power. Interrogate me, then, and I will be a scholar representing his lesson to his master. We will begin with your family, Monseigneur. My mother, Anne of Austria, all her sorrows, her painful malady. Oh, I know her. I know her. Your second brother? asked Aramis, bowing. To these notes, replied the prince, you have added portraits so faithfully painted that I am able to recognize the persons whose characters, manners, and history you have so carefully portrayed. Monsieur, my brother is a fine, dark young man, with a pale face, he does not love his wife, Henrietta, whom I, Louis the Fourteenth, loved a little, and still flirt with. 
even although she made me weep on the day she wished to dismiss Mademoiselle de la Valliere from her service in disgrace. "'You will have to be careful with regard to the watchfulness of the latter,' said Aramis. "'She is sincerely attached to the actual king. The eyes of a woman who loves are not easily deceived.' "'She is fair, has blue eyes, whose affectionate gaze reveals her identity. She halts slightly in her gait. She writes a letter every day, to which I have to send an answer by Monsieur de saint -Aignan. "'Do you know the latter?' as if I saw him, and I know the last verses he composed for me, as well as those I composed in answer to his. Very good. Do you know your ministers? Colbert, an ugly, dark-browed man, but intelligent enough, his hair covering his forehead, a large, heavy, full head, the mortal enemy of Monsieur Fouquet. As for the latter, we need not disturb ourselves about him. No, because necessarily you will not require me to exile him, I suppose? Aramis, struck with admiration at the remark, said, You will become very great, Monseigneur. You see, added the prince, that I know my lesson by heart, and with heaven's assistance, and yours afterwards, I shall seldom go wrong. You have still an awkward pair of eyes to deal with, Monseigneur. Yes, the captain of the musketeers, Monsieur d'Artagnan, your friend. Yes, I can well say, my friend. He who escorted La Valliere to Le Chaillot, he who delivered up Monk, cooped in an iron box, to Charles the Second, he who so faithfully served my mother, he to whom the crown of France owes so much that it owes everything, do you intend to ask me to exile him also? Never, sire. D'Artagnan is a man to whom, at a certain given time, I will undertake to reveal everything. But be on your guard with him, for if he discovers our plot before it is revealed to him, you or I will certainly be killed or taken. He is a bold and enterprising man. I will think it over. Now tell me about M. Fouquet. What do you wish to be done with regard to him? One moment more, I entreat you, Monseigneur. And forgive me, if I seem to fail in respect to questioning you further. It is your duty to do so. Nay, more than that, your right. Before we pass to Monsieur Fouquet, I should very much regret forgetting another friend of mine. Monsieur du Vallon, the Hercules of France, you mean? Oh, as far as he is concerned, his interests are more than safe. No, it is not he whom I intended to refer to. The Comte de la Fere, then? And his son, the son of all four of us. That poor boy who is dying of love for La Valliere, whom my brother so loyally bereft him of? Be easy on that score. I shall know how to rehabilitate his happiness. Tell me only one thing, Monsieur Dublay. Do men, when they love... Forget the treachery that has been shown them? Can a man ever forgive the woman who has betrayed him? Is that a French custom, or is it one of the laws of the human heart? A man who loves deeply, as deeply as Roux loves Mademoiselle de la Valliere, finishes by forgetting the fault or crime of the woman he loves, but I do not yet know whether Raoul will be able to forget. I will see after that. Have you anything further to say about your friend? No, that is all. Well, then, now for Monsieur Fouquet. What do you wish me to do for him? To keep him on as superintendent, in the capacity in which he has hitherto acted, I entreat you. Be it so, but he is the first minister at present. Not quite so. A king, ignorant and embarrassed as I shall be, will, as a matter of course, require a first minister of state. Your majesty will require a friend. I have only one, and that is yourself. You will have many others by and by, but none so devoted, none so zealous for your glory. You shall be my first minister of state. Not immediately, Monseigneur. 
for that would give rise to too much suspicion and astonishment. Monsieur de Richelieu, the first minister of my grandmother, Marie de Medici, was simply bishop of Lucon, as you are bishop of Vannes. I perceive that your royal highness has studied my notes to great advantage. Your amazing perspicacity overpowers me with delight. I am perfectly aware that Monsieur de Richelieu, by means of the Queen's protection, soon became cardinal. It would be better, said Aramis, bowing, that I should not be appointed first minister until your royal highness has procured my nomination as cardinal. You shall be nominated before two months are past, Monsieur d'Herblay. But that is a matter of very trifling moment. You would not offend me if you were to ask more than that, and you would cause me serious regret if you were to limit yourself to that. In that case, I have something still further to hope for, Monseigneur. Speak, speak. Monsieur Fouquet will not keep long at the head of affairs. He will soon get old. He is fond of pleasure, consistently, I mean, with all his labours, thanks to the youthfulness he still retains, but this protracted youth will disappear at the approach of the first serious annoyance, or at the first illness he may experience. We will spare him the annoyance, because he is an agreeable and noble-hearted man, but we cannot save him from ill health. So it is determined. When you shall have paid all M. Fouquet's debts, and restored the finances to a sound condition, M. Fouquet will be able to remain the sovereign ruler in his little court of poets and painters. We shall have made him rich. When that has been done, and I have become your Royal Highness's Prime Minister, I shall be able to think of my own interests and yours. The young man looked at his interrogator. M. de Richelieu, of whom we were speaking just now, was very much to blame in the fixed idea he had of governing France alone unaided. He allowed two kings, King Louis the Thirteenth and himself, to be seated on the self-same throne, whilst he might have installed them more conveniently upon two separate and distinct thrones. "'Upon two thrones,' said the young man thoughtfully. "'In fact,' pursued Aramis quietly, "'a cardinal,' Prime Minister of France, assisted by the favour and by the countenance of his most Christian Majesty the King of France, a cardinal to whom the King his master lends the treasures of the state, his army, his council, such a man would be acting with twofold injustice in applying these mighty resources to France alone. Besides, added Aramis, you will not be a king such as your father was, delicate in health, slow in judgment, whom all things wearied, you will be a king governing by your brain and by your sword. You will have in the government of the state no more than you will be able to manage unaided. I should only interfere with you. Besides, our friendship ought never to be, I do not say, impaired, but in any degree affected by a secret thought. I shall have given you the throne of France, you will confer on me the throne of St. Peter. Whenever your loyal, firm, and mailed hand should join in ties of intimate association the hands of a pope such as I shall be, neither Charles V, who owned two-thirds of the habitable globe, nor Charlemagne, who possessed it entirely, will be able to reach to half your stature. I have no alliances, I have no predilections, I will not throw you into persecutions of heretics, nor will I cast you into the troubled waters of family dissension. I will simply say to you, the whole universe is our own, for me the minds of men, for you their bodies. And as I shall be the first to die, you will have my inheritance. What do you say of my plan, Monseigneur? I say that you render me happy and proud, for no other reason than that of having comprehended you thoroughly. Monsieur d'Herblay, you shall be cardinal, and when cardinal, my prime minister, and then you will point out to me the necessary steps to be taken to secure your election as pope, and I will take them. You can ask what guarantees from me you please. It is useless. Never shall I act except in such a manner that you will be the gainer, 
I shall never ascend the ladder of fortune, fame, or position, until I have first seen you placed upon the round of the ladder immediately above me. I shall always hold myself sufficiently aloof from you to escape incurring your jealousy, sufficiently near to sustain your personal advantage, and to watch over your friendship. All the contracts in the world are easily violated, because the interests included in them incline more to one side than to another. With us, however, this will never be the case. I have no need of any guarantees. And so my dear brother will disappear? Simply. We will remove him from his bed by means of a plank which yields to the pressure of the finger. Having retired to rest a crowned sovereign, he will awake a captive. Alone you will rule from that moment, and you will have no interest dearer and better than that of keeping me near you. I believe it. There is my hand on it, Monsieur d'Herblay. Allow me to kneel before you, sire, most respectfully. We will embrace each other on the day we shall have upon our temples. You the crown, I the tiara. Still embrace me this very day also, and be, for and towards me, more than great, more than skilful, more than sublime in genius. Be kind and indulgent. Be my father. Aramis was almost overcome as he listened to his voice. He fancied he detected in his own heart an emotion hitherto unknown. But this impression was speedily removed. His father, he thought. Yes, his holy father. And they resumed their places in the carriage, which sped rapidly along the road leading to Vaux-le-Vicomte. 